Yeah, thanks for inviting me and greetings from the Netherlands. So sorry I cannot be in person. Uh, I will tell you about Gabor Phase Retrieval and the talk will be in a much sense complementary to uh, what we had yesterday with Mark. This, uh, Mark was talking about uh, continuous setup when you have infinite dimensional objects, so, um, uh, functions that you want to reconstruct, and we're going to talk about fine dimensional setup when you have everything discretized. Uh, so I'm going to start with a brief introduction, um, even though I think many of you already know about that. So um, the motivation, the standard one, is diffraction imaging. And we have a small particle illuminated with X-ray source um, waves, and uh, we measure diffraction patterns in the far field. And then our measurements are um, absolute value squared uh, pointwise of the Fourier transform of the object. We're gonna start uh, right away by discretizing anything, everything that is here and assuming that our X lives in fine dimensional space, XM, um, CM, complex uh, M dimensional space, right? So uh, then, um, well, free F phase retrieval asks if we can recover this object X, this vector X, from uh, this point by squared absolute values of the free action form. Um, well, right away, if we have a discrete uh, Fourier transform here, that is this um, omega is just ZM. And then, of course, the answer is no. We can assign any possible um, phases here and going to have a different X each time. But maybe we can capture some um, trivial ambiguities. So uh, whatever is our set omega, so how even how often we subsample, uh, still we cannot get rid of some of the ambiguities, namely, if we multiply our, oops, there should be x here, our x with an um, absolute value one complex number as a, as a common multiply of all the coefficients, then of course this absolute, uh, th this constant is not seen by our measurement map, so we cannot distinguish between these two measurements. Also, if we shift our uh, signal by some time t, then um, yeah, again, this shift will be seen in the uh, phases of the Fourier transform, but not in the magnitudes. And we can also invert the time and take the complex conjugate of that, and um, then still cannot distinguish. Uh, so um, <clears throat> these are the trivial ambiguities. There can be more, depending on how do we select our set um, omega where we sample our Fourier measurements. But the idea may be to introduce a little redundancy. And this can be done by adding masks after our object in our measurement process. So now we have a mask which we know, which we manufactured, and which changes the uh, form of the waves that go to the detectors. Mathematically, we can model this with a point-wise multiplication of our object X with a known mask GK. And we can use several masks in this case, um, so make a series of measurements instead of just one and generate redundancy, right? So now we have more information. The question is if this is enough, right? So now our, we have mask free phase retrieval here on our map, <laughs> where we have um, X point wise multipli multiplied with the known masks and we want to recover. And there are two questions that we want to ask. How many um, measurements we should use, how many masks and how can we construct this mask so that we have injectivity? up to uh, some minimal ambiguity that we can uh, allow to have. And uh, in if we um, actually look in into uh, the actual measurements, they're always noisy. So injectivity is really not enough. We want to have stability of our measurement map. That is, so we want to make sure that if we have uh, um, close by measurements, they come from close by uh, signals. And the other question uh, is, of course, how to recover. It's not enough to know that the solution exists. You actually want to find it. Um, this problem is by no means new. Uh, it's been around for a really long time. But um, with this free air formulation, there is not much wiggle, t wiggle space to actually uh, introduce um, reach theory, which would allow to solve a, a reach toolbox. So the uh, idea would be to consider a more general setup. Um, get rid of the free air. For a, for a second, and consider um, a generalized setup when we take our measurements with them, um, all the complete set of uh, measurement maps. So for that, we need a notion of a frame. Uh, we call a frame a set of um, vectors in our space. 
so that we have this uh, generalized uh, versatile identity that hold for them. So I would like to, you to think about uh, the frame as a generalization of a basis notion. In basis, we have just enough measurements uh, to recover X, but if we lose some of the information, there is no hope to um, recover X anymore because we have nothing to cover for that misinformation. So the idea behind frames is to introduce this redundancy and in finite dimensional case, a frame is just a spanning set of the ambient space CM. Uh, in high dimensional case, um, in in uh, infinite dimensional case, you would actually need to, to go with this definition where A and B are frame bounds, uh, should be finite, uh, both of them. But in finite dimensional case, these two things are equivalent. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna introduce some uh, notions and some, some um, terms that I'm going to use about frames. First of all, I'm going to uh, um, abuse notation a bit and uh, interchangeably use phi for a set of vectors as a frame and uh, a matrix where, which has this vector stuck in them in it as, as columns. Uh, I'm going to call both of them phi and use interchangeably. Um, I'm going to refer to frame coefficients, the, uh, the inner products between our signal x and the vectors from the frame by j. So these are just the projections. And of course, uh, just with a, as with the basis, we want to be able to go back from the uh, set of uh, frame coefficients to our signal x. And we can do it using a dual frame. A dual frame has the same cardinality as uh, the frame phi. And x can be recovered uh, from the frame coefficients by taking the linear combination. So the better dual frame, which I'm going to use in this talk, um, point is just given by pseudo inverse of the uh, adjunct. Right, so these are some of the notation that I'm going to use. Uh, so how frames are connected with our phase retrieval problem? Well, we can formulate the phase retrieval problem for a, an arbitrary frame, uh, just as we did it for um, Fourier measurements and mask Fourier measurements before. Now we introduce our measurement math, which depends on our frame phi as um, assigning to each signal x the list of its uh, absolute value squared of its uh, frame coefficients. And we want to recover x from this set of measurements. Um, so of course, um, again, if we introduce a global phase factor, then we cannot um, uh, tell apart between x and x multiplied with the global phase factor. So we want to factor this out, right? So we're going to be talking about recovery on the up to global phase factor. Uh, so um, I'm going to talk about equivalence classes of X with respect to this equivalence relation um, so that I can be able to say that uh, A phi is injective and uh, stable. Right, so um, if we have a Fourier phase retrieval, then our phase uh, frames of that frame vectors are given just by the harmonic vectors. For mask free phase retrieval, again, we can see it as a frame, as a special type of frame, where the frame vectors are uh, harmonic vectors, point wise multiplied with our masks. Um, right, so for this talk, we're gonna focus on the special case when uh, the masks um, are not different, but uh, the same mask shifted around um, in respect to the object. Okay, so for HK, I'm going to introduce GK, the mask, as the shifted version of some window G. Um, to give you a little bit of a motivation why this is interesting, well, for me, it's interesting because it gives rise to Gabor frames, uh, which I happen to know stuff about. Um, but from practical point of view, this also makes sense. So for um, typography, so it's a nice picture from yesterday's talk. Um, we have a little short support window, which we want to move around the object. Um, especially it's important in the case when the object is a living tissue, so we don't want to expose it to too much radiation. Um, but also in some completely other, completely different in nature applications like audio processing. And we do speech recognition or try to solve music source separation problem. And we have an orchestra playing and we want to tell the musical instruments apart, for instance. A common tool, a common object um, with which we work in the setup is um, a spectrogram of our music piece. 
which is exactly the magnitudes of this um, masked Fourier transform when we have a short support mask that we shift um, along the timeline. Um, so yeah, uh, this shifted uh, mask setup is very much important for many applications. So it makes sense to study it. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna formalize it in form of a Gabor frames. So here's a definition of a Gabor frame. So for, to generate a Gabor frame, we choose a window gene, couldn't be zero, um, but any uh, vector in CM otherwise. And I choose a set lambda, which would correspond to a pairs of time frequency shifts that I want to take. And then a Gabor frame is just a collection of this time and frequency shifts of my window gene, where a time frequency shift is defined as a composition of a first uh, translation operator, so just cyclic permutation of the entries of my uh, vector, of my object x, my vector x, and um, modulation is a shift, is a translation, but on the freer side. So it's a pointwise multiplication with the free vectors. All right, so uh, this is the definition of a Gabor frame. Little note that exactly if I take the inner product of um, X with the element of this Gabor frame, uh, what I have is an um, auth coefficient in the frequency representation of a pointwise product of X and the translated version of G. Right, so I, um, if I have for the frequency shifts here, all the M, and for uh, time shifts, some pre-selected set T, or a K, I called it, then exactly I have my windowed Fourier transform for the Gabor measurements. <clears throat> right, so we want to study phase retrieval with Gabor frames. That's our goal for this talk. And uh, in five-dimensional setup, I would say that most of the results are that are there concern random Gaussian frames. When we consider every vector in the frame to be generated at random and independently of all the other vectors. Um, the reason for that um, is not coming from practical point of view, but rather from the fact that for such frames, uh, we have a well-established toolbox of high-dimensional probability theory, uh, which uh, helps us to prove stuff. But once we lose this independence between frame coefficients, introduce some structure which comes from the application that we're trying to work with, well, of course, this independence uh, between the frame, frame vectors is lost, and we need to come up with some neutral box. So today we're going to discuss how we can construct such a toolbox for Gibbon frames. Right, so uh, two questions, injectivity, stability, and the reconstruction. So we're gonna go through them in order. And the first thing I want to talk about is uh, injectivity and stability. So for which frames phi we can hope to recover X, right? So for which frames phi, at least we have injective measurement map. Uh, well, if there are some good news, uh, for at least for um, generic frames. So if we have too few measurements, we don't have enough redundancy to uh, have injectivity for phaseless measurement map. So uh, there is the result um, which tells us that we have to oversample at least factor of four. Right? So number of measurements should be up to this little uh, O of one um, of order of four M. So that F, um, AF, F is, F phi is um, injective. At the same time, if we consider a generic frame phi, 4m minus 4 measurements is enough. So um, that's very nice, right? So it's very tight, uh, low and upper bounds. Uh, so that's good news. The bad news, of course, is that it's a generic frame phi. So generic here uh, can be interpreted in, um, in the sense that if we consider, if we fix the cardinality of phi, and consider the set of all frames with this cardinality and those with the risky topology, then we have open then set of frames that satisfy <laughs> injectivity property. Uh, for us uh, today, we're going to think about it as if frame five was going to have independent vectors coming from a suitable distribution such, uh, such as uh, Gaussian distribution. So in this case, with probability one, we have an adjective measurement map, which is associated to them. 
But um, the structured frames have probability zero in this metric, right? So um, they involve maybe unlucky exceptions from that. Um, as I already said, injectivity is not always enough. If we um, assume that there will be some noise in our measurements, we want to know um, how far away our, this can land us in our domain. And so in other words, we need to know how far uh, are the measurements for different up to global phase factor X and Y. So I have a somewhat complicated expression here. Uh, this is just to say that X and Y are different uh, with the up to global phase factor. Um, again, there is a wealth of results for random frames um, which vary in three parameters. So we need to say, what is the distribution for your uh, frame vectors? Do you assume any restrictions on the admissible set team of vectors that you want to recover? And how many measurements do you need to take? So there is some selection of the results. Of course, it's not an exhaustive list. Uh, there are many more. I just selected a few. Um, so um, if you want to be really restrictive, on the distribution of phi j, right? So here can allow to be restrictive on the cardinality of phi j, oh, sorry, on the distribution of phi j. Then you can have a cardinality of the frame, which is linear with respect to the ambient space dimension. So um, and have some constant times m measurements. And you can allow to recover all uh, elements uh, in CM. So T going to be CM in this case. If you want to relax the assumptions on the distribution of IJ, then you have to pay a price of losing some part of the admissible set. And so then you can only um, recover flat vectors that no, nowhere vanish. Uh, if you want to have to be able to recover any vector in CM, and at the same time don't want to put too, restrict, too much restrictions on IJ, then you have to pay the price of increasing the cardinality by log factor and having it of order um, m log m instead of, of order m. But uh, the common uh, feature of all this um, of all these results, common condition that all they have is independence of frame vectors. Uh, and uh, this is not just a coincidence. This is actually a crucial assumption which um, heavily influences the proof tactic and determines it. So if we want to go to the field of structured frames, such as Gabor frames, for instance, um, then um, well, this toolbox is no longer usable. So we need to um, shift uh, the attention from our probabilistic characteristics to structure and geometric properties. And uh, I could use structure and geometric properties to use to prove uh, stability and Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> and exploit structure of our frame and the geometric properties of it. So for Gabor frames, if we focus on the structure of how this frame is constructed, then we can have um, stability and inductivity results like that. So uh, if we put an assumption on our window G, so that uh, if we take its phaseless measurement map of itself, it's no longer vanishing. We can have injectivity up to global phase factor of the full Gabor frame measurement map. Right? So uh, here we have all the time shifts and all the frequency shifts. So overall, we have m square measurements. Remember, for independent vector setup, we only had linear in m, or maybe up to log factor. Um, similar story with stability. You can also have stability, but the price to pay here is a more restrictive assumption on the window gene, right? So now you have not just no over vanished, but actually bounded away from zero, and you have to restrict the admissible set of factors of signals, right? So now uh, we only can recover uh, signals that um, are in each coordinate bounded away from zero. We can also uh, abstract from structure and uh, try to use the geometric properties of frames. Um, so here is the result which uses random window. So it's kind of a middle ground between fully random frames within the band frame vectors and this deterministic results. Then uh, we just put a deterministic assumption on, on the window gene. So if you let our 
window G to be random, we can have stability uh, on the whole CM with high probability. But still, um, there is a common feature of all of this free results that I present here. And that's that we only talk about full Gabor frames when we have a other sample, right? So um, we have M square instead of linear in M measurements. Um, this last idea with the geometric properties is not specific for Gabor frames because we do not exploit the, structure, the particular structure that Gabor frames have. So we can also um, translate it into more uh, for more generic frames and it just reformulate stability in terms of this geometric property. And geometric property that um, happens to be relevant, which I'm going to uh, properly define in a second. Well, it's um, basically the measure of how well spread the, of the frames of our, of the vectors of our frame are in space. And so intuitively, a good frame. Um, Nice properties would mean that you cover all the directions in your CM space uniformly. So if you pick one particular direction, there will be no too many vectors that are almost orthogonal to it, or almost collinear to it. And that's what captured in frame order statistics. Here's a technical definition. But basically what this means is the following. So this uh, smallest frame order statistics with index alpha means that if we order uh, all the frame coefficients in the absolute value, and then throw away n minus alpha smallest ones. The rest is at least this big. Um, and uh, likewise, largest frame order statistics with index beta here means that if we, again, with the ordered in absolute value uh, frame coefficients, throw away n minus beta largest ones, the rest are at most this big. So uh, with throwing away largest and smallest ones, the rest, the bulk of the frame coefficients and absolute value are between these two uh, values. And it turns out that uh, this uh, frame order statistics are quite closely linked with the stability of the phaseless measurement map associated to a frame. So if for a frame, um, we have a uniform bound on the smallest frame order statistic, when we throw away a portion um, of, of the measurements, um, then um, we can have a stability and the constant depends on the number of um, vectors in the frame, the kinetics of the frame, and also on this un uniform bound on the smallest frame order statistics. Um, all right, so that's, that was for generic frames. Let me come back to uh, Gabor frames. So as we saw going below M square measurements is hard apparently because there are no results, but it's actually a conceptually hard task. Um, it's quite easy to see if we um, lift the measurements into high dimension into the case of matrices. So that the absolute value squared of the inner product of A and phi, uh, X and phi J is the Hilbert Schmidt inner product of X star X and phi j star phi j, right? So um, then we can re reformulate our problem in terms of um, this Hilbert Schmidt inner products as constraints. And the two other constraints that we have is that now the matrix X, which corresponds to our vector, is rank one and positive semi definite. So we can see this as a rank minimization problem. Um, but if we have M square measurements and this um, lifted frame vectors, phi j star phi j are linearly independent in that set, then we have just a feasibility problem, which is much easier to solve. That's why M square is a kind of a bound, which is conceptually hard to cross. Um, another problem, another trouble with phase retrieval in terms of injectivity is that we have actually contraexamples. So in the results we considered here, um, this window J was a uh, full support close to that. If we allow J to be compactly supported and have a short support sparse, then um, we may construct a counterexamples that even for large lambda, even for full level frame, can um, break down the injectivity. Um, yeah, so we saw this geometric property tool 
which allow to reformulate stability in terms of um, um, this geometric property of uh, frame model statistics. But unfortunately for Gabor frames, it so far only leads to non-uniform stability result, which tells that if we fix a pair of signals, then we can distinguish them with this measurement map stably with high probability, but not simultaneously for all the pairs. So it's not very useful for practice um, observation. Um, but nonetheless, um, even though uh, there is some um, problem with the injectivity in some cases, uh, it's still an interesting property. The pro it's still an interesting problem to see how we can recover from time frequency structured measurements because we just saw that it's very <coughs> relevant for practical applications. So let's uh, now change into the second problem problem of reconstruction. So for which frames we can have an efficient algorithm to that would allow us to recover X from uh, those phaseless measurements and uh, ideally also robust to noise in the measurements. Again, for Gaussian frames and uh, the like, uh, when we have uh, frames with independent frame vectors, we have many different reconstruction algorithms. I won't talk about them much because uh, there are so many of them. Um, but uh, for most of them, reconstruction guarantees only proven for this case when we have completely random frames with independent frame vectors. There are some, ex some exceptions. For phase lift, for instance, you can have independent Gaussian masks in the mask creators. Um, set up, but still for most of them, you have to stick with the random frames. Um, another issue is that for Gabor frames, as we just saw, we have lack of injectivity results. So we don't really know if there exists a reconstruction method that would give us the right solution. So uh, the idea how to fix this is to use several masks. Instead of just using one Gabor frame, we can consider a union of two or several Gabor frames. And just like um, we hope that adding masks to the uh, Fourier phase retrieval setup would help us with redundant by this redundancy we introduce, we can also hope that several masks in the Gabor setup will help us to achieve stability and uh, to create some reconstruction algorithms. So we're going to switch back to mask Fourier phase retrieval for a second. And now we're going to consider the set of masks that is constructed in one of the two ways. In one way, uh, first is when we have independent and identically distributed masks. And the other when we have the shifts of the same mask. So second exactly corresponds to the um, Gabor frame setup. So that's uh, the second one is where we're mostly interested in. Uh, and then we can actually construct a reconstruction algorithm for, for this setup that I just described with the masked free transform. So if we let um, the set of masked GK be as one of the above, then we can construct a set of additional masks uh, so that we have a reconstruction algorithm which would allow us to recover uh, X and we have the bound for the reconstruction error. So we have some robustness to noise result here. Uh, so I formulate this theorem as an existence result, but of course, uh, that's not just an existence result. We construct the set of masks uh, explicitly, and we also have an explicit reconstruction algorithm. Uh, and what's important for us for this discussion is in the second case, when our masks are the shifts of the same mask, that is, if our primary frame was a frame, this additional set of masks that we need to add to our measurements, um, they form the second Gabor frame. So in this case, we have a union of two Gabor frames as our measurement um, measurement design. Um, all right, so uh, this is the stability result, the, the robustness result, but let's see how we can achieve this. So the idea is called polarization approach and it's based on the, on the following. Yeah, so this is our problem. We have our measurement frame uh, lambda. So we have all the frequency shifts and all and selected time shifts. So it's, the measurements would correspond to mask 3 m And we have um, the phaseless measurements with respect to that. Well, um, most of the approaches do, they try to recover X directly from these measurements. 
we're going to make it in two steps. First, we're going to aim to reconstruct the phases of these measurements. Um, and to recover the phases, so, so if you know the phases, right, um, then we have our uh, frame coefficients. The frame coefficient approximation would be just u lambda times the square root of b lambda. How to construct uh, the phases? Well, for this, we need um, relative phases. Yeah, so we can only hope to recover up to global phase factor anyway. So we can um, just as well assign phase one to one of the measurements and then use um, this relative phases to propagate phase. Uh, so there are two questions here, right? First, how do we compute the relative phases? And the second, how do we propagate? So let's start with the first one. Um, to compute relative phases, we're going to need polarization identity. That's what we're going to use. So uh, here, basically, what we see is that the relative phase, up to some normalization, uh, is a linear combination of another set of phaseless measurements. When you take a phaseless measurement um, of x with a linear combination of the two vectors from our primary frame. Right, so now uh, we have measurements with the union of two frames, one which we're actually going to use for reconstruction, and the other one which we're going to use for uh, to compute this relative phases. And in the setup, when we have the primary frame as a Gabor frame, G lambda, this additional measurements actually also form um, mass Fourier transform. They have this mass Fourier transform form. Uh, when we have additional mask added to what we already had, uh, and if you restructure this uh, formula a little bit, uh, you can also see it as the shifts of masks. So you have two Gabor frames of uh, two different windows. The one we selected at random and the, the other one modified from the primary one. <clears throat> um, so second question is to how propagate the phases. Well, the basic idea would be like that. So we start with some measurement, which is non-zero and say that, so the C, C lambdas are gonna be the approximations of the frame coefficients. Uh, and we say that it just has phase one. And then if we know a uh, relative phase between this lambda zero and some lambda one, um, then the approximation of the phase for this frame coefficient is going to be just the relative phase between these two. And we can iteratively um, continue this procedure, going uh, further and further, propagating the phases uh, until we have um, all, the, all the lambdas with the phases associated to them. Um, so that would work like that if we have all the relative phases computed, but that would be too many, right? Then we'd have a order M square measurements again added. Um, so the valid question is how should how large should be the set of um, relative phases that we compute in this approach? So we can think about it as a graph setup um, when we have uh, the way the vertices for our graph as lambda and the ages associated to this relative phases that we computed. So if we have that one of the measurements is zero, then there is no relative phase that is def well defined. Yeah. So uh, this means that we cannot propagate through this. So actually this has an effect of deleting all zero uh, vector or zero vertices from this uh, measurement graph. And once we delete all the zero vertices, we have two connected components that, that are left after, after this procedure, then we cannot synchronize phases between these two. So uh, to enable recovery, we must have at least one uh, big connected component, which is so big that we have enough uh, frame coefficients there to recover our X uniquely. Um, but if we have noise in our measurements, and we should agree that we always do, then it's not that only the zero measurements um, with the primary frame that cause trouble, right? So if we have a very small measurement, um, then the relative phase as well as you can still compute it, but it's going to be very unstable to noise perturbation because you divide by the absolute values of, of this um, measurements, right? So um, in this case, you also want to delete 
not only zero measurements, but all the small enough measurements. So you want to define some thresholds and delete everything that is below it. Um, and you also want uh, to have a big connected component after you do this, and so that you have not just enough uh, to reconstruct, but enough to stably reconstruct, right? So you want to have some backup to uh, mitigate the noise that you may have propagated. Um, so how should we construct the set E of the additional measurements of the relative phases? Well, we should construct it to be big enough so that the associated graph is not just connected, but it's well connected. It's hard to break it into a connected, a small connected components. We want to ensure that if you delete some portion of the measurements, you still have a connected component, which is big enough. And you can do this um, using a randomized construction. In this case, you need to have a folder of log M um, additional measurements. Right, so uh, this is the summary of the measurement procedure that we do. It's uh, a lot of text on the slide, so I'm gonna just discuss three lines uh, with you. First, uh, yeah, as we already discussed, we need to delete, once we computed all the relative phases using the additional measurements, we need to delete all the vertices with the smallest weights. It turns out that uh, vertices with the largest weights also cause trouble because uh, we not only want to recover the phases, but we all also want them to um, go from this brain coefficient measurements to vector, uh, and we don't want noise to grow there as well. Um, so we dilute here a portion of largest and smallest um, smallest uh, measurements. We want to, of course, control how many we delete. So here, our frame model statistics that we defined before come in very helpful because they exactly help us to control how many vertices we delete here. Um, right, then uh, instead of the phase propagation procedure, which I described, uh, it would be useful to have something more stable, right? Because if you do this one-by-one -one propagation of the phase, you know, it accumulates from one vertex to another, it's not a very suitable procedure. You want to somehow synchronize the noise. You want to have some noise cancellations, ideally. So um, for that, we used the angular synchronization procedure and to have a reconstruction guarantees for angular synchronization procedure to control noise on that setup, on this stage. You need not just a connected component, but a strongly connected component with a bounded away from zero spectral gap. Uh, yeah, so... That's the summary of the algorithm. So um, I'm going to the last part of my talk now, and I want to talk to you about how we can improve it, right? So we, in, in this measurement procedure, we still needed of order log m extra masks uh, to compute all the phases, which bring us to m log m many measurements in total. But we know that it, um, most probably of order M measurements should be enough. So how can we maybe um, improve the procedure so we can have robust reconstruction of X but with a smaller number of measurements? One idea is to choose uh, to, to select this additional set of masks adaptively. So in our previous measurement procedure, we assume that we construct all the measurements, measurement factors, primary and additionally additional um, at the same time, and before we see our signal X. But in, in the actual measurement procedure, you don't do all the measurements at once, not necessarily. Uh, you Sometimes you can do them in portions, right? So if we first do the measurements with the primary um, frame, we can have some information about X that we can then use to uh, construct this additional set of masks uh, in a meaningful way, adaptively. Uh, in this case, and it, if we do this, we can reduce the number of measurements required to be linear in the number of, uh, in the ambient dimension um, of our problem. And again, have a similar reconstruction guarantees. Uh, another, another possible approach is to use prior information. And so um, we oftentimes have the case that 
Uh, we uh, don't try to reconstruct any X, but we actually know something about uh, the space of signals that we try to reconstruct, or maybe some properties um, that X has to satisfy. And now we can formalize it into some um, prior knowledge model. One way to do this is just to assume that we know uh, the space or a set T where X lives. And in fact, the example here is a sparse phase retrieval. When we try to recover um, only signals with the support size bounded by S. Another model is a generative price model. When we assume that X is an image of some vector in a smaller dimensional space um, under a known generative model map. Uh, which may be complicated, but we can assume that we know it in advance. Um, so, uh, a couple of days ago, we heard a great talk about deep generative bias. Uh, and we have um, G of H actually given by a, um, a deep neural network on, on trait. Um, but um, yeah, we also can have a toy model when the generative model is actually just a linear map. So, it's like a, very small part of it uh, without any non-linearities. Um, but still, you can still argue that in some applications that could be a meaningful model. When we, if we have already observed a lot of data beforehand um, and we want to recover a new piece of data, but we know that it's from the same class, we can use uh, some dimensionality reduction to uh, have a generative model gene. Um, all right, so let's talk about sparse phase retrieval first. So here uh, we assume that X lives in TS in the set of all sparse S sparse vectors with support size at most S. And again, uh, for Gaussian frames, we are pretty close to optimal. We can have a robust reconstruction with uh, one of the standard methods with um, S square log M over S measurements. Um, and uh, there's also a two-step procedure uh, that allows to recover from S log M over S measurements, which is actually optimal number. But what happens if we add structure to that? What if we talk about the global frames? Um, first of all, um, even though intuitively it seems that if we reduce the size of the admissible set, right? So if we pose this uh, pretty strong assumption of being sparse vector, that should make the problem easier, but it's not necessarily the case for global frames because of the structure that, it, that they have. In particular, we cannot have at the same time a small support of G of the window that we're using and a small support of the signal that we're trying to reconstruct. If, it's, uh, if this is too small in, in comparison to each other, then you don't have injectivity. Then you can construct a contrary example of two different signals that would give the same set of measurements. Um, but um, you can still see improvement numerically at least if you restrict the class of, um, uh, of admissible signals to being sparse um, for many of the standard algorithms. Um, yeah, so what happens if in our polarization approach? Well, then our measurement map is not Gaussian, oh, sorry, is not Gabor anymore, right? So we have this additional set of measurements. We have a union of two Gabor frames. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this polarization approach is particularly suitable for um, adding prior information. The reason for that is that we can see it as a two-step procedure as well, right? Because we recover the phases of our measurements. And then after that, we have a linear inverse problem, right? So then we just need to recover a sparse signal from the side of its uh, frame coefficients. Uh, so what we can do with our polarization approach, we can construct a um, measurement frame. So the, uh, choose a distribution for G to be a, Steinhaus window, which means that all the entries of G have the same absolute value and random phase. And then construct the appropriate system of time frequency shifts and additional masks 
that would uh, allow to recover from uh, this many measurements, right? So if you compare it to the Gaussian case, it's of course very much suboptimal. Yeah, so you have um, high powers of S, and uh, high powers of log and S and also log M, so it's uh, like a lot. Um, but still, um, compared to what is known for Gabor frames, that's already a small win. Um, in the end, I want to talk briefly about generative primes. So we saw this uh, wonderful result um, that if we have untrained deep generative priors given by a neural network, when we have the weights being generated independently from Gaussian distribution, then we can reconstruct um, a sparse signal from this many measurements, right? So it's again, very close to optimal. And um, we also saw that this bound can further be improved. Uh, for Gamma frames, we are not there yet, but we can consider the toy problem when the generative price um, a linear map. Yeah, so we just reduce the dimensionality of our vector by this gene. Um, and then we can, uh, using this polarization approach again, construct a set of measurements again. So we construct a set of time and frequency shifts and additional masks. So uh, we can reduce the number of measurements to depend on D instead of um, instead of ambient dimension M with high probability. Um, yeah, so um, I think I'm going to close here with a um, list of some challenges and some possible approaches that uh, we discussed today. And um, yeah, so this slide is a kind of um, implicit invitation as well. I recently got a grant uh, to work on these issues for Gabor phase retrieval and also on some others, which um, aimed to link, to, to bring closer the theory of Gabor phase retrieval and the practical needs. And uh, in 2024, I'm gonna be uh, organizing um, a workshop. The idea for this workshop is to have some list of topics in advance, and then during the workshop, have a brainstorming sessions and groups and have a presentations uh, like a, uh, project proposals uh, in the end. So if you're interested in participating in something like that or collaborating with any of these issues, please let me know. I will be very glad to hear from you. So thank you for your attention.